In this video, I'll present the strongest form of the cosmological argument from contingency for God's existence. I'll also present the strongest criticism, which has something to do with the principle of sufficient reason. Along the way, we'll see why some criticisms are weak. For example, the criticism that begins with the question, what caused God or what caused the necessary being, is a very weak criticism, and we'll see why. Okay, so let's jump into it. So most people already have underdeveloped notions of the major arguments for and against God's existence. So for example, when you were in elementary school, you probably thought of a crude version of the cosmological argument. It probably went something like this. Everything has a cause. The causes cannot go back infinitely, so there must be a first cause. And this first cause is God. Now, the crude objection to this crude argument is then, well, what caused God? Okay. But you were in elementary school and there are better arguments on both sides. No intelligent philosopher of religion uses this form of cosmological argument, but this version does give you a feel for how cosmological arguments work. They start with scientific observations about how events are dependent on other events, and they work back to an independent event or being. So if cosmological arguments work, they show that there exists a fundamental and an independent reality beyond what science can see. <clears throat> so the purpose of this chapter and video is to clearly present and criticize the deepest forms of cosmological argument. Now, in my opinion, the deepest form of cosmological argument is the cosmological argument from contingency. One interesting feature of this argument is that it's consistent with the universe being infinite or finite. This type of argument does not depend on the impossibility of an actual infinite. Now, if you're familiar with the Kalam cosmological argument, and it's okay if you're not. But if you are, keep in mind that this argument is different. Right? One difference is that the Kalam cosmological argument is based on the universe having a beginning. But the cosmological argument from contingency is consistent with the universe being eternal or having a beginning. Um, so since there are different cosmological arguments, many of the criticisms of the Kalam are irrelevant to this form of cosmological argument. Okay, let's look at the argument. Now, um, actually, let's look at three concepts we need to understand before we understand the argument. Right? So the first concept is contingent beings. Now, contingent beings are dependent beings that do not contain in themselves the reason for their existence. So everything we, observed, uh, everything we observe is contingent. You know, the reasons for your contingent existence are oxygen, your parents, your grandparents, and so on. So contingent beings do not necessarily exist. They could have not existed. Now, notice defenders of this argument are going to say beings that do not contain in themselves the reason for their existence instead of beings that are caused by other beings. And this is because the argument does not depend on the idea of causation like the Kalam cosmological argument does. Uh, rather, it uses the idea of contingency and dependency or necessity and independence. We'll revisit these important points later. Okay. Now, as we shall see later, the whole universe is contingent. It might have been the case that nothing existed at all. And again, we'll see that later. Okay. The second concept is necessary being. A necessary being, if it exists, is a being that has within itself the reason for its existence and essence. A necessary being is one that could not have failed to exist. Now, you are not a necessary being because you depend on oxygen, food, and at one time your parents to exist. You could have not existed. Nor is energy a necessary being, arguably, because energy is affected by other forms of energy and does not contain in its qualities within itself. We can also imagine quarks as existing differently or not at all. Um, so we don't scientifically observe a necessary being, but we can, illogically, we can logically infer the existence of such a being if the cosmological argument is sound. Now, you might be confused by these concepts, so I recommend an analogy from Eric Rayton. Um, from his book, Is God a Delusion? Now, imagine that contingent beings, that they are train cars that are pulled by other train cars. An unnecessary being is the engine car that has the principle of movement within itself instead of outside of itself. Now, imagine, too, we're watching these train cars go by, and we've never observed an engine car. We don't see it right now. Rather, we infer the engine car exists based on the dependent movement of the non-engine cars. So keep this analogy in mind as you consider this argument. Okay, here's another important point. It is incorrect to say the necessary being or God or whatever is self-caused. This is because cause presupposes time. For example, if A caused B, what we usually mean is A preceded B and brought B into existence, or at least was simultaneous with B. 
So if God is self-caused, then God preceded God and brought God into existence, which is clearly absurd. So this is why philosophers and theologians do not say God, if God exists, they don't say God is self-caused. Rather, they say God is independent, self-existent, or uncaused, or necessary. And notice these terms are analogous to an engine car's principle of movement. If God or a necessary being exists, then this being is not a cause of itself, but it does have the sufficient reason for its existence within itself. So, isn't that an interesting way of talking, right? <laughs> okay, one final point about necessary beings. A being is necessary, too, if it could not have possibly, if it could not possibly have failed to exist. So some would say the laws of mathematics are necessary, and this is because it seems like mathematical laws like 2 plus 2 equals 4 are true no matter how the world is. Even if the world were different, it seems like 2 plus 2 would equal 4, right? So if the cosmological argument works, it makes room for a necessary being like God, and not just necessary truth. So um, other arguments like the ontological argument will then be needed to unpack what precisely it means to have a necessary being. Okay, so if you're a little confused, all we've done so far is define contingent beings, right? Beings that do not contain in themselves a reason for their existence, and necessary beings. And those are beings that has that would have within itself the reason for its existence. And the analogy is the train cars are contingent beings, the engine train car is a necessary being by analogy. Okay, the third concept is the principle of sufficient reason, PSR. So PSR is the idea that everything has a sufficient or complete reason for its existence. It's the belief that there is a sufficient reason even if we don't know the sufficient reason even if we can only give partial reasons. For example, there's a sufficient reason for why I exist, even though I can only give a series of partial reasons. Uh, my parents, my grandparents, oxygen, food, and so on. Now, some people believe that rationality itself is based on PSR. When we do science and when we think rationally, we believe there are sufficient reasons for events. We don't believe that things just pop into existence. So it seems like PSR is reasonable. Again, the principle of sufficient reason, PSR, is the idea that there is an explanation of why it is the way it is and not some other way, according to Taylor. It leads to questions like, why is there something rather than nothing? So, to better understand PSR, Taylor asks us to imagine encountering a translucent sphere in the wilderness. Surely you would think there is an explanation for why the sphere is there and why it has the properties it does. You wouldn't think it's just inexplicably there, with no explanation at all to be discovered. It doesn't matter if the sphere grows to the size of the universe or if it's relocated. It's reasonable to believe that there's a sufficient explanation for its existence either within itself or outside of itself. And this is the principle of sufficient reason. So in the question section, I'll ask you more about PSR so you can form a more reasoned opinion about it. Okay, now that we have the vocabulary, the three concepts down, let's consider a simplified version of the cosmological argument from contingency, which you see on the screen. Premise one, there are contingent beings. Premise two, contingent beings do not sufficiently explain themselves, nor does the totality of contingent beings sufficiently explain itself. Premise three, the principle of sufficient reason is true, or at least rational to believe. Everything has a sufficient reason for why it is and why it is the way it is, even if we don't know that reason yet. And then the conclusion is what explains these contingent beings must be a non-contingent being, a necessary being. Okay. Again, to understand this argument, a train analogy may help you. All right. Imagine I explain the movement of a train car by referring to the next train car pulling it. And this is not a sufficient explanation of the first train car's movement unless I can explain why the second train car is moving. So I refer to the third train car pulling the second that in turn is pulling the first. Of course, there is no sufficient explanation of the first car's train's movement if this line of reasoning continues finitely or infinitely. Therefore, I must infer the existence of an engine car, a different kind of car, a car that has the reason for its movement within itself. This engine car is analogous to a necessary being. In short, if you believe the principle of sufficient reason is reasonable, then you must infer the conclusion that a necessary being exists. 
Again, since the train cars cannot sufficiently explain the movement of any or all cars, we must infer the existence of an engine car if we accept that there is a sufficient reason for any one car's movement. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, why can't they go in a circle, or is there some other possible reason? We'll explore in the question section why there isn't, why there must be, to use the analogy, an engine car, a necessary being. Okay, now the engine car also has a sufficient reason for its movement, but this sufficient reason is within itself instead of outside of itself. That is, there's no external car pulling the engine car because the engine car is independent, necessary, in that way. To ask what external car is pulling the engine car is to beg the question and to misunderstand the premises of the argument and the inference from those premises, right? So if this argument is sound, an engine car must exist. Now again, this is not a perfect analogy, but it should give you a better sense of how the argument works and why asking what caused the engine car, why that's a superficial objection. Now consider another analogy from Leibniz. Now keep in mind that Leibniz uh, invented calculus, did a lot of intelligent things, and he presented this argument. So he's no idiot. So any presentation of the cosmological argument that sounds idiotic is probably not the version that Leibniz presented, right? <laughs> okay. So Leibniz asks us to imagine a book entitled The Elements of Geometry that has existed eternally. So one edition of the book has uh, always been copied from the preceding edition. Now if that is the case, then you will never have a complete explanation if you go back infinitely, for you will always have to ask why at all times these books have existed. That is, why there have been any books at all, and why this book the elements of geometry in particular. Now, Leibniz says what is true concerning these books is equally con true concerning the diverse states of the world, for here too the following state is in some way a copy of the preceding one, although changed according to certain laws. However, he says, however far you turn back to antecedent states, you'll never discover in any or all of these states the full reason why there is a world rather than nothing nor why it is such as it is. Now Leibniz continues, he says, You may well suppose the world to be eternal, yet what you thus posit is nothing but the succession of states, and you will not find the sufficient reason in any one of these states, nor will you get any nearer to accounting rationally for the world by taking any number of them together. The reason must therefore be sought elsewhere. Hence, he says, it is evident that even by supposing the world to be eternal, the recourse to an ultimate cause of the universe beyond this world, that is to God, cannot be avoided. So Leibniz believed that there may be an infinite regress of scientific effects and causes, of books in this case, but this infinite regress just doesn't fully explain why this infinite chain of contingent beings exists. When we do science, we keep pushing the explanations back one step, but we can always ask, you know, why that state? Why that state? Why that state? Right? And Leibniz kind of captures this with the book analogy very well. Okay, if you're a bit confused by the cosmological argument from contingency, simply keep one of these analogies in mind. The first analogy is the train analogy, where we observe only train cars and then infer the existence of an engine car, even though we've never seen one before. And this engine car, we infer, has the principal movement within itself, right? The second analogy is from Leibniz, where he asks us to imagine an infinite number of book copies to help us understand that an infinite number of contingent books does not offer a complete or suffi sufficient explanation of the book. That is, the finite or infinite series of contingent beings, books and train cars, cannot explain themselves. Again, it doesn't matter if the series is infinite or finite. So notice how different this is from other cosmological arguments which deny the possibility of an infinite series. The version that Leibniz presents seems to work even if the universe is infinite. So in short, if a person's understanding of the cosmological argument is based on the impossibility of an infinite regress, then they don't understand the deeper form of cosmological argument that we're talking about here. Okay, here's another point. These two analogies are to help you understand some key features of the cosmological argument from contingency, but they should not be confused with the argument itself. After all, uh, we are all familiar with engine cars and books and so on. We think of them as located in time and space and created by humans, and this is where the disanalogy really arises. But the analogies, the parity, does help the novice understand the deeper elements of the argument. 
especially have a how a finite or infinite number of contingent beings cannot fully explain themselves and how a necessary being solves that problem if you go with BSR. So to evaluate the cosmological argument from contingency, let's review a bit of logic. There's only two ways arguments go bad. Bad premises or bad inference from those premises. Bad reasoning from those premises. So the reasoning in this argument is good. So you have to question one or all of the three premises in the argument to intelligently critique it. And we'll do that in the question section. In some of these questions, I'll refer to the Copplestone russell debate from 1948. And that's probably the most famous debate in philosophy or religion. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. Again, notice that Copplestone defends the cosmological argument from contingency, but he's not crudely inferring the existence of an uncaused cause from the premises that everything must have a cause in the series of causes cannot be infinite. He's not using that crude argument. Rather, Copplestone is arguing the existence of contingent beings implies the existence of a necessary being because every event must have a sufficient reason, and this necessary being is consistent with God's nature. Furthermore, he argues the universe itself cannot be necessary because a necessary being could not depend on contingent parts, as we saw in the book analogy from Leibniz, and I'll clarify this later. We'll also see that Russell has a deeper objection. He's not like Richard Dawkins, who presents a really crude objection, and says, oh, what caused God, what caused a necessary being, and all that. Rather, um, Bertrand Russell questions the principle of sufficient reason, and that's the deeper way to question this form of argument. So let's get to the question section. Thanks. Okay, so here's the question section. Question one, explain how the argument hinges on the principle of sufficient reason, PSR, and what are the consequences of rejecting PSR? Well, the most profound way to critique the cosmological argument is to question PSR. In the debate between Copplestone and Russell, Russell says, quote, I see no reason for believing the principle of sufficient reason, end quote. We can see events have causes, but why should we suppose they have sufficient explanations? Why should we suppose the universe ultimately makes sense? So you could reject PSR to avoid the conclusion of the cosmological argument from contingency. Not only Russell, but Mackey rejects PSR because he sees no reason for why we should demand that, quote, things should be intelligible through and through. End quote. He also writes that the form of the cosmological argument, which relies on the PSR, fails completely as a proof for that reason. So, um, yeah. However, you want to think carefully about the consequences of rejecting PSR. The first consequence is that the universe is not ultimately intelligible if you reject PSR. So science, logic, math, introspection, they can, go, they can give us partial explanations, but never a full explanation if you reject PSR. So to use the analogy again, this is because we cannot fully or sufficiently explain train car one's movement with an infinite or finite number of train cars, unless you have an engine car. Indeed, Mackey and other critics recognize that there is nothing about science that claims to explain everything. Science is about the empirical causes we can find for empirical effects, and there is no scientific reason to believe there is a complete explanation for any empirical effect. So Mackey asks, quote, why assume the world must conform to our intellectual preferences for complete or sufficient explanations? Huh. So other thinkers like Proust and Coons, they disagree and they believe that science presupposes PSR and that it would end if we accepted anything as brute fact. They also argue that PSR is intuitively obvious and that people only reject it when they're talked out of it because it leads to the existence of a necessary being. Okay, So is it reasonable to reject PSR? Is it reasonable to say that train cars and books can go back infinitely or infinitely with no complete explanation? Well, I'll simply say that people disagree and they have different intuitions about PSR. Still, I think questioning PSR is a much better criticism of this argument than asking what caused God or necessary being, as we'll see in, in later questions. Now, to push the point further, it seems biased to reject PSR simply to avoid the conclusion of this argument. That would be special pleading. On the other hand, it seems we can do science without assuming the ultimate intelligibility of the universe. The scientists are actually seeking partial explanations for everything. I mean, more pragmatically, pragmatically the scientists may seek what works instead of what's real. 
Again, Mackey believes PSR is an unwarranted extension from empirical experience and that science is just fine without PSR. So for every state of affairs that science discovers to explain another state of affairs, we can always ask, well, what is the cause of that state of affairs? And just goes on and on. You know, what would a complete sufficient explanation look like? You know, so here's the key point. If you believe science could one day sufficiently explain everything, then you accept PSR. But this argument shows that the acceptance of PSR means you must accept the existence of a necessary being. You can't have it both ways. The central point is that the cosmological argument for contingency is about PSR, and people have different intuitions about whether PSR is true. So my advice is to think deeply about PSR and form your own opinion. But don't reject it simply because it leads to conclusions you don't like. On a personal lever, level, you know, um, I go back and forth on whether I think it's reasonable to reject PSR. Okay, let's go to the second question. Why do questions like what caused a necessary being or who created God seem to miss the point? Why do they miss the point? Well, if the argument proves the existence of a necessary being, then one begs the question in asking how the necessary being is contingent. That is, if the argument proves there is a being that has the reason for its existence within itself, then one misses the point in asking what the external reason or cause is for the being that has the reason for its existence within itself, right? So think of the train car analogy again. If the argument proves there must be an engine car, then only the person who misunderstands the argument will ask, well, what car is pulling the engine car? If the argument proves there is an engine car, no external car is pulling the engine car. Now, this is just an analogy for the cosmological argument, so you would not want to say, but it makes sense to ask who created the engine car, right? When we move away from the analogy to the actual argument, it makes no sense to ask what caused or who created the necessary being, because the argument proves there is a necessary being that is independent. People have a hard time understanding this because they have, you know, heard this sort of crude reply many times. But this crude reply, you know, what caused God and so on, only works against crude forms of the argument, the kind you might have thought in elementary school presented at the beginning of this video. So let me put it like this. It's a good criticism to ask what caused a necessary being or God if someone gives you this crude argument, everything that exists has a cause, the universe exists, so it has a cause, which is God. But the cosmological argument from contingency is much more sophisticated than this crude version. And so this objection is a very weak one when presented against it. Again, the cosmological argument from contingency does not assume everything is contingent. Rather, it argues there must be a necessary being since everything we observe is contingent. Again, asking who caused God or who caused a necessary being is a poor response to the deeper forms of cosmological argument. A better response is to question PSR. Now there's one further point here. The universe cannot be the necessary being any more than the non-engine train cars can sufficiently explain their movement. Again, the defenders of this argument are not assuming the conclusion that there is a necessary being. They believe the argument proves the conclusion. That is, a sufficient explanation cannot come from the series of train cars itself, but must be transcendent like the engine car or original book or author. Those who ask who caused God are actually the people making an assumption. They are assuming there is no independent or no necessary being, even though the argument just gave good reasons for believing one exists. So their fallacy is called begging the question. And I'll further develop these points later. Okay, let's jump to question three, which is related. Give an example of where Dawkins presents a straw man in his book, The God Delusion. Well, Dawkins claims that cosmological arguments, quote, rely upon the idea of a regress, and they invoke God to terminate the regress. They make the entirely unwarranted assumption that God himself is immune to the regress. And this is on page 77 of his book. Well, as Rayton explains, the objection is confused. That God himself is immune to the regress is hardly an assumption in this argument. Rather, the argument identifies what something must be like to end the regress. The argument is that if PSR is true, the regress must be ended. 
the thing that ends the regress will have regress ending features. In short, the argument is not assuming a necessary being, it is inferring it from the premises, one of which is PSR. Now Dawkins does not address contingency and necessity, but instead critiques a crude form of the argument that's popular among people who haven't researched it in much depth. Now as a side note, I believe Dawkins does a good job arguing against the teleological arguments based on biology. And this is to be expected since Dawkins is an expert in biology. However, he does a poor job on the cosmological argument. He presents a straw man and then knocks it down. So the lesson is that a person may be a genius in one area of expertise, but be ignorant about the history and nature of arguments in other disciplines. Okay, let's go to the fourth question. So many people question premise two and they get confused. They say, so why do defenders of this argument believe it's fallacious to argue that the series of contingent beings explain or cause themselves? Why can't I just argue that the infinite series of causes sufficiently explains itself? Why can't I argue that the universe itself is the necessary being? That is, why can't I argue that the whole universe is necessary, right, but not the parts? I mean, why do I have to think there's this engine car, a necessary being that we can't see? Why can't the universe itself be it? Okay, so that's the fourth question. To answer the fourth question, Remember that just as the train cars cannot explain their movement without an engine car, so it is with contingent beings in relation to the necessary being. One may assert the train cars form a circle and are self-sufficient, but is this not circular reasoning or begging the question? Also, the question then arises as to what caused the circle of contingent beings, since adding up contingent beings does not equal a necessary being, any more than adding up chocolates gives you a sheep, to quote Copplestone. Again, think of the book example from Leibniz. An infinite number of reproductions of books does not explain the book or how it came to be here. To end it, you need an original book, an author perhaps, which has the unusual feature of not being a copy of some other book. This analogy is not perfect, but it helps people understand the deeper elements of the argument. In short, an infinite regress or an infinite circle does not sufficiently explain any particular contingent being nor the series of contingent beings. So you must accept the existence of a necessary being if you accept PSR and the other premises. Now you might simply reject PSR and say the universe is a brute fact. We already explored that option when we explored PSR. For now, I'm just gonna focus on those who think the universe can fully explain itself. Now, many people don't grasp this point because they imagine the universe itself could be necessary even though it's made up of contingent parts or beings. So let's dwell on this point more since it's rather subtle. Some have questioned premise two, in other words, by arguing the series of effects and causes that we scientifically observe can explain themselves. We don't need to appeal to anything outside the series, like an engine car, original book, necessary being, or God. So Eric Raton explores, or explains, Paul Edwards's attempt to do just that in the following way. So Edwards argues this. Imagine a group of five Eskimos are standing on a street corner in New York City. Now suppose you ask why this group is in New York, and I tell you that the first Eskimo is fleeing the cold northern climates. The second is the wife of the first Eskimo. The third Eskimo is their child. The fourth came to audition for a TV gig. And the fifth is a private detective keeping tabs on the other four, um, or the fourth Eskimo. Now, since I've explained why each Eskimo is in New York, haven't I explained why the whole group is there in New York? Well, Edwards thinks so and he draws the following conclusion. If you've explained each member of a set, then you've explained the entire set. And so he concludes that if every dependent or contingent being is explained in terms of another one, the whole collection has been adequately explained. But is he right? I don't think so, and Raytan gives the following example to explain his mistake. Suppose you asked me why the five Eskimos were in New York and I gave you the following answer. Eskimo 1 followed Eskimo 2, who followed Eskimo 3, who followed Eskimo 4, who followed Eskimo 5, and Eskimo 5 is in New York because he followed Eskimo 1. 
Of course, Rayton observes that this does not sufficiently explain anything at all. He also notes that Edwards' example is a bit different because Eskimos 1 and 4, in Edwards' example, they're explained by something outside the group, like cold weather or auditioning for a television gig. Rayton's example is truly internal. It explains each Eskimo by reference to another Eskimo in the group. But Edwards' is, is not truly internal. right? They're not truly explaining themselves. The point is, is that a truly internal set that only refers to themselves, Rayton's Eskimo example, the second one, that sort of truly internal set is one that cannot sufficiently explain itself. The second Eskimo example does not sufficiently explain why the group of Eskimos or any particular Eskimo is there. It's circular. Now you might be confused here, but all I'm arguing is that premise true two is true. Contingent beings, nor the series of contingent beings, right? They cannot sufficiently explain themselves. No contingent being can fully explain itself, just as no Eskimo can fully explain why she's there without reference to the other Eskimo in the examples. Furthermore, and more importantly, an infinite group of contingent beings cannot explain themselves any more than an infinite number of Eskimos can fully explain their location. So to conclude, deeper reflection shows that premise two is strong. A finite or infinite regress of contingent beings does not explain anything sufficiently. Each contingent being we scientifically observe cannot explain itself, nor can the series of contingent beings explain themselves. Therefore, if you agree with the principle of sufficient reason, you must infer the existence of something outside the series, a necessary being, an engine car, an original book. And according to some people, this necessary being seems very close to the concept of God. So, before moving on, let's review the argument again. It's highlighted on the second page of this chapter, and it's on the screen. So, take the time to seriously consider it instead of these weaker arguments, uh, cosmological arguments that rely on temporal ideas of cause or the impossibility of an infinite regress. Think deeply about PSR and whether you agree or disagree with it. Clearly explain why you agree or disagree with it. Be careful about applying any science you know since this metaphysical argument relies on reason, not simply science. Once you have analyzed and evaluated the argument, return to this next question, question five. Okay, here's question five. Evaluate the following criticism. This argument may prove the existence of a necessary being, but it doesn't prove this necessary being is God. Good question, okay. Good criticism here, all right. So this seems to be a strong criticism. It's an easy way to criticize any cosmological argument. Again, even if the cosmological argument works, why must this first cause or necessary being be the God that you worship? Why couldn't it be like the force in Star Wars or some impersonal force, right? Well, a theist may counter that a necessary being has many of the attributes of most conceptions of God. You know, this necessary being must be self-sufficient, timeless, very powerful. For example, one might argue the necessary being is timeless because it's bound by nothing. The theist will press the issue with two more responses. The first is that the cosmological argument does show it's rational to believe in something unobservable upon which everything depends. That is, it makes faith seem more reasonable. It shows there's a transcendent reality beyond the reach of science and observation. The theists may also argue the following way. Following way, I'm sorry. They um, meditate and reason what a necessary being must be like. If the argument shows that it's reasonable to believe a necessary being exists, then we can use other arguments to try to determine what the necessary being must be like. Indeed, the ontological argument could be seen as just that. It's an attempt to get insight into the essence of a necessary being. So this is how some theists argue the necessary being must be or is probably God. So another argument theists might present is based on the idea that the universe uh, began to exist. If that is the case, the necessary being cannot be unconscious because you know it had to create some point. You know it had to do something from within itself. In other words, if the universe began, it must have a mind, the, the creator, not a substance or so they argue. Now I'm not going to address why the necessary being has the attributes of most conceptions of God. That would make this video too long. I'll simply say that many theists believe this argument is one one argument among many 
that make a cumulative case for the existence of a transcendent being. Now there are also arguments against such a being, arguments like the argument from evil, but we're only focusing on the cosmological argument in this video, so I'm just going to move on from five and avoid that. <laughs> okay. Number six, can we know something that exists without being able to visualize or conceive its nature? The answer is yes. I know that light exists, but I don't understand how it can behave simultaneously as a wave and particle. I know that light exists, but I don't understand its nature or essence. Also, I know my ancestors existed, even though I can't visualize them. So how does this apply to the cosmological argument? Well, those who support the argument infer that a transcendent reality like God exists. They, they're not saying that we understand that something. It implies that engine cars exist, not that we understand the nature or essence of an engine car. If I had never seen an engine car before, I would be puzzled by how it could possibly move itself. Nothing in my experience shows me how that is possible, but PSR seems to indicate that it may be possible. So in short, the criticism that the necessary being does not make sense is a weak criticism if the argument gives good reasons for believing a necessary being must exist. right? In a similar way, if we know light exists, the idea that the essence of light doesn't make sense is not a good argument against the essence of light. Against the existence of light, I'm sorry. Now some people will get confused at this point and they'll think I'm comparing the belief in God to the belief in light. And this would be a mistake. I'm merely arguing that if we have good reasons for believing God or light exist, then the argument that God or light does not make sense is not a good argument. But a critic may press the point here. They might say, what I mean is Immanuel Kant showed a necessary being is impossible when he criticized the ontological argument. So shouldn't we resist the conclusion of the cosmological argument? That is, if it's impossible for a necessary being to exist, a being whose essence involves existence and who cannot not exist. If it's impossible for a necessary being to exist, then shouldn't we reject the conclusion of the cosmological argument since it affirms the existence of such a being? Well, I'll explore this in the next section, but for now I'll simply review one point in logic. It is illogical to reject an argument because you dislike the conclusion or believe it false. To rationally respond, you need to show what is wrong with the premises or the reasoning from the premises. Analogously, if I think it's impossible for light to exist because of the wave-particle duality or something, I should not simply rely on that argument. Rather, I should also show what is wrong with the argument that you present in support of the existence of light, you know, that we see and feel light and so on. Again, you should not reject the cosmological argument simply because you think the conclusion is wrong. You should show what is wrong with the premises or the reasoning from the premises in the cosmological argument. Okay, question se 7. Is saying a necessary being exists analogous to saying a round square exists? If there is a contingent being, must there be a necessary being? Well, the short answer is no. Round squares and merry bachelors are logically impossible. However, there is nothing logically impossible about a necessary being. Indeed, the cosmological argument, if it's sound, proves the existence of a necessary being. There's nothing metaphysically impossible about a necessary being. Of course, to fully understand this point, you have to carefully consider the ontological argument. And let's save that long discussion for another day. All right. Number eight. Isn't it fallacious to argue that everyone has a mother? Therefore, the human race has a mother? Isn't this the composition fallacy? Okay, good question. I'll just say, um, yes, that is a composi composition fallacy, and Russell briefly mentions this in the debate before moving on to deeper criticisms. Now, as for the composition fallacy, you know, the mother of the human race thing, the cosmological argument is not arguing like that. It's not arguing that since each human has a mother, there must be a mother of the human race. Rather, it's arguing that neither each human nor the totality of humans has a sufficient explanation for their existence, so there must be a necessary or transcendent reason for their existence. Also, one could say the cosmological argument moves from dependence to independence, not from parts to whole, like in the composition fallacy. So failure to grasp these points is a failure to grasp the cosmological argument from contingency. So I believe this is why Russell later moved on and presented a stronger criticism of the cosmological argument. 
that is a question PSR. However, even if you move from part to whole in this argument, it's not automatically fallacious. This is because the composition fallacy is an informal fallacy, not a formal one. You can see my videos in logic for the difference. For example, it's not fallacious to infer the whole wall is red. You know, if every brick in the wall is red, and there's nothing but bricks and nothing in between them, right? It's sometimes valid to move from parts to whole. As we saw earlier, if the parts are contingent, the whole or totality is contingent. Now, whatever the case, whatever you think, I do not think this argument depends on a movement from part to whole. Okay, number nine says, why do you say reason instead of cause? Can you explain the difference between sufficient reason and cause? Well, there are several differences. One difference is that many people think of cause as involving time. So A usually temporally precedes B if A causes B, or it's temporally simultaneous with B. However, sufficient reason doesn't involve time. If the cosmological argument used this temporal conception of cause, it would be a ridiculous argument because it would be asserting that the necessary being precedes itself in time and therefore, or thereby, causes itself to exist. But how could A exist before A existed and cause A to exist? <laughs> it's silly. This is why it's important to distinguish between temporal causation and sufficient reason. So as in many religious theologies, the creation of the world refers to dependence. A could be dependent on B even though both A and B are eternal. When theologians say God is uncaused, they don't mean that God brings God's self into existence, rather they mean God depends on no other being to exist. God exists necessarily, and God can neither come into being nor perish. So I encourage the casual listener to pick up a philosophy of religion text so they can better understand the fine distinctions made by the greatest atheist and theistic thinkers on this. Um, they do require in-depth study and they're not easily grasped, but it's very interesting. Okay. Question 10. Compare the cosmological argument from contingency with the Kalam cosmological argument. Okay. This is a good question. It's important to distinguish among the different versions of the cosmological argument. One reason it's important is because the criticisms that apply to one may not apply to the others. So to support the Kalam, people argue that an actual infinite is impossible, so the universe must have a beginning. In the contingency argument, it's the principle of sufficient reason that makes an infinite chain of contingent beings an inadequate explanation. So one major difference is the Kalam depends on the idea of causation and the impossibility of actual infinites, whereas the cosmological argument from contingency does not. So there's a difference between saying uh, an actual infinite is impossible and an actual infinite does not give a sufficient explanation. That's a big difference. Okay, look at number 11. What about modern physics? Hasn't science proved that some events are uncaused? If so, isn't the principle of sufficient reason false or at least uh, dubious? What about the science of quantum physics or quantum fluctuations or multiverse theory? Okay, <laughs> so that's a good question. First, I'm going to bluntly say that science has not, proving some, has not proven that some contingent events are uncaused. Actually, scientists disagree on how to interpret quantum, quantum physics, and I won't try to explore it here. But if you go with that interpretation, then what it gives you is some reason to reject um, PSR. And so we're back to the PSR criticism that we already explored. Second, the arguments outlined in this video are applicable to all these scientific theories when terms are precisely defined. The question is, does everything that exists explain itself, or does it have a reason for its existence outside of itself? Everything that exists may be all the multiverses, all the strings, or quantum fluctuations outside of space and time that gave rise to space and time, but the question remains, do these multiverses and quantum fluctuations and so on, do they explain themselves or does something outside of them explain them? The power of this argument, the cosmological argument, is that it's relevant to whatever model of the universe you adopt. Quark, string theory, multiverse, oscillating, bouncing, prancing, whatever. The same questions of dependency and independency arise. Nor should you say the laws of science 
caused the universe, since scientific laws and principles are descriptions of how things are. We don't think of them as causal reasons for why things exist. Do you believe the law of gravity would exist if there were nothing? Now, some people do believe mathematical laws would exist even if there were nothing, but I won't explore those ideas here. I'll say that people, intelligent people, disagree with each other. And I'll simply say that the dominant view is that the laws of physics are descriptions of reality, not causes of it. Right? It might be wrong, but that's the dominant view. Now, some philosophers and scientists speak of nothing in curious ways. For example, Stenger says, nothing is the simplest of all things. Krauss, too, talks as if nothing is something. But this seems to be a category mistake. Things are simple and complex. Nothing is not simple or complex. There's nothing there to be simple or complex, if there's nothing. <laughs> right? Furthermore, most philosophers would say quantum fluctuations outside of space and time are something, not nothing. But even if you define it as nothing, why are these quantum fluctuations unstable? And why are they producing universes like ours? That is, the questions of dependency and contingency and independency and necessity, they arise even with the deepest scientific theories. And it's precisely these questions that make the cosmological argument seem sort of strong. Notice, too, that nothing we see in science seems to be independent or necessary. Many people, many believe the universe begins, so it's not infinite. But even if the universe is infinite, why does that make it necessary? A necessary being is one that's not eternal. I'm sorry, a necessary being is one that is not only eternal. It's not only eternal, but it's independent. It has the reason for its existence within itself. And it could have not existed. But why does anything we scientifically observe have to exist in that sense? It just doesn't. So think about the contingency of our universe. Physicists tell us that we could have had a different universe, a different value for the cosmological constant, gravitational constant, rate of expansion, and so on. It just doesn't seem like anything in this universe or the universe itself necessarily exists. Nor is energy necessary, since energy could have not existed. Since any field of energy has properties shaped by energy fields outside of itself, it doesn't seem necessary. And third, any energy fields that make up an object like a planet could have been replaced by other energy fields to make up that planet. In short, energy itself is not a necessary being, and this becomes most apparent when you deeply explore the meaning of necessary. So, in short, we just cannot escape the fundamental questions of dependency and independency by appealing to science. And it's precisely these concepts that make the cosmological argument persuasive. Okay, so let's apply PSR to the external reason for the universe. Let's call this reason Big G. PSR forces the question, question does Big G have the reason for its, for its existence within itself or outside of itself? Let's say Big G is dependent on Big G G, and Big G G is dependent on Big G G G. Again, we have the same problem. An infinite regress or a finite regress of such contingent beings outside of time and space does not sufficiently explain any one of the beings or the totality of the G beings. We arrive back at the same argument we started with, except we're outside of time and space now. Again, this argument does not depend on time and space like some cosmological arguments. It depends on dependency and contingency and independency and necessity. So these are logical and metaphysical issues, not something science seems able to address because science presupposes certain logical and metaphysical issues itself. Now, to avoid all this, you could simply reject PSR. <laughs> Why should the universe be intelligible through and through? Why do we believe the limits of reality can be embraced by our minds? So this, in my opinion, is the strongest criticism of the cosmological argument from contingency, not asking what caused God, what caused a necessary being, or appealing to science. Okay, question 12 is very interesting. It says a necessary being can only have necessary effects, so how can there be a necessary being? Well, the answer is, you know, I could get deep into this question, but I'll simply say that an engine car or an original book need not only produce engine cars or original books. 
The strongest form of PSR says every being has a sufficient explanation within itself or outside of itself, not that it entails or produces only things like itself. Right? Okay, so let's kind of get to a conclusion here. Exploring the cosmological argument makes one more aware of the rational attempts to demonstrate God's existence, or at least the existence of a transcendent reality that science cannot see. Currently, I can imagine that everything that exists could have failed to exist. And this brings up the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there something rather than nothing? The, the question is puzzling, and many think it's silly. But the cosmological argument from contingency will deepen our understanding of it. If the argument works, it gives good, rational reasons for believing the existence of a necessary being that defies imagination. And it takes us one step closer to answering the question of why there's something rather than nothing. Indeed, the limits of the human mind are probably not the limits of reality. And this argument seems to give reasons for believing that it's rational to believe in what may be an irrational being behind it all. If the argument works, there may be a transcendent reality that explains itself and cannot be fully grasped by our worldly way of thinking. If the argument is sound, it proves the striking claim that a necessary being exists. While such a being may not necessarily be identical to one's conception of God, it's consistent with the belief in the existence of a powerful, timeless, unseen being that sustains the existence of the contingent universe. Those who misunderstand the argument offer superficial criticisms like who or what caused the necessary being or why can't the universe itself be necessary. Yet there are deeper criticisms of this argument, such as the rejection of PSR itself. Still, if you reject PSR, you want to carefully think about the consequences of doing so. Whatever the case, the argument is much deeper and more interesting than the one I encountered in elementary school or in popular books, or in online chat forums. And I hope you find the same. On the last slide, I have some of the resources I used um, in forming my ideas over the years on this argument. Thanks.